Hi, this is Chet Glidkowski and welcome to our fourth installment on the series called The Grove. This week we're talking about what happens with neglect. Maybe you live here in Central Florida like I do, or maybe you live in another part of the country. It doesn't matter. We've all drove, driven by a grove or an apple orchard, a peach orchard, it doesn't matter. We've all seen some that look absolutely luscious. They're green, lots of fruit, lots of blossoms, lots of life. But we've also seen some like this picture where they are just dried up, there's no leaves, there's lots of weeds, there just looks like nothing is going on, there's no fruit, there's no action, there's no life. And the important thing to realize is that there's only one difference between the two groves, the one that's really green and the one that's really dead, the one that has lots of fruit and the one that is totally fruitless. And you know what that is. It's neglect. Now all you have to do is nothing. I'm going to say that again. All you have to do is nothing for a grove to go from something that is producing fruit and useful to something that is useful for nothing other than to be pulled up and burned. Same thing with an apple grove or an, or an apple orchard or a peach orchard. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is nothing. I was driving up the uh, road the other day and there were two groves that were right next to one another. On the right side, beautiful orange trees, well taken care of, well manicured, uh, ground, nothing growing over the trees, lots of fruit maturing, and on the other side, oh, it was awful. All these dried up trees, nothing, no fruit, no leaves, and I was struck by the image. All they had to do was nothing. And it's the same way with our spiritual lives. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the the book of Revelation chapter 2. And while you're turning there, let me sort of set the stage. The Christian church was birthed on Pentecost, that's Acts chapter 2, and there there were people from the area called Asia. And Asia in the Roman Empire had a capital, and that capital was the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a great city, very powerful city, had lots of culture, growth, economic growth, and they had lots of religious life there too. It was a port of call, lots of banking and commerce, but the big thing, the sort of center of the culture, the center of the city, was something called the Temple Diana. It was named as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Diana, sometimes called Artemis, was a goddess of fertility. And so they prayed and sacrificed to her for the crops to come in. But more than just a place of worship, it was also a bank. So it was a place of commerce. And this great city, people f who had traveled from Ephesus to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, heard about Jesus and they returned. And a church was birthed there and it grew tremendously over the years. But at this point in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus speaks to them. Listen to what he says to this church. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. They were a hard-working group of people in Revelation 2, too, these people who were in the church at Ephesus. And he says their deeds, that's the work that was assigned to them, the workmanship, they were active, they weren't just sitting around. When Marianne worked at Johns Hopkins Hospital, her job was sticking people and drawing blood, and she was very diligent at that. Maybe you have a garden and you diligently plant the seeds and fertilize and nurture the garden and keep out the weeds and then harvest it. So you know what that's like. Maybe you work in an office where you work with information and people and you diligently work at it on a daily basis. This hard work made them tired, weary. It was uh, the idea is just the idea is lifting up soil, 
and getting themselves dirty. It's like working on a wall, repairing walls, and you get that plaster dust all over you. Maybe you don't get a lot of dust on you working at your computer or on the phones, but you understand what hard work, what hard toil is. It was that they had worked that kind of way in their lives for Jesus, and they did it with perseverance. They were patient. They stayed at the tasks. They stayed alive. It's like running up stairs. They didn't stop in the middle and sit down. No, they kept on pressing, and they kept at the task. In their faith, they were persevering. They kept, they kept climbing the walls and they kept going, even though it was rough and rugged and hard. And they were test, and they were tested, and they tested those who came along. There were false teachers who came along, and they said, "Well, what do these false teachers say? Let's examine it. Let's test it against what we know is true and grade it." They examined it. They looked around at it and they declared that they were false. They false prophets, these false apostles, they were found to be liars. They weren't just, well, it was sort of wrong. They, they were making false statements on purpose. The people, the leaders, and the members of the church at Ephesus were being commended by Jesus for this great work and working hard and staying at the task. But he continues in verse 3, You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Wouldn't you like that to be said about you when you come to the end of your days? And Jesus is saying to this church in Ephesus, Man, you, they have just done a great job. They have persevered. It's sort of to stay, again, stay behind the task waiting till they get to the end, enduring till the end. They did not allow bribes or they did not allow the culture to turn them away. There was a lot of pressure on them, but they didn't move away from it. Some people say, you know, I just want an easy life. But they were praying hard, they were working hard, staying at the task, even though it wasn't easy. They were holding fast. They endured hardships. They waited on God. They held on to God. They reached out to God and held on tight and buried their fist in his, in his arms and said they were waiting for him. Boy, doesn't that sound good like these were really faithful people. And it was all the way through. They had not grown weary. That's like coming to the intersection of discouragement and hopelessness. They weren't they had grown weary, but they were still faithful. They were remaining true. Boy, wouldn't you like to go to a church like that? I mean, just excited about things. That they were working hard, staying true. But Jesus says, you know what? All this is good, but there is one thing. Yet I hold this against you, Jesus says in Revelation 2.4. You have forsaken your first love your first love. Wow, the idea that even though they were remaining true, they were remaining faithful, they had let something go. They were holding against, Jesus was holding this against them. There were many attractions in the city and he was holding this one thing against them. It's sort of like a, a clamp holding down. He says, I hold this against you. And he said, why was it that he held against them? They had forsaken. They had left behind. It's sort of like an unfortunate divorce. I'm sure we've all either personally or been touched by a divorce. That's what the idea is they had forsaken. They had left a commitment. What was that commitment? Their first love. First not in the order of one, two, three, but first in the order of priority. Their first love, the thing that should be driving them more than anything else that first of priority, they were had left it. Consider how far you have fallen, Jesus says in Revelation 2, 5. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Jesus doesn't just condemn them, but he gives them a way back. He tells them, he says, consider. Remember to think about, but not just noodle it in your head, but noodle to the point of response where your life changes. He said, consider these things, how far you have fallen. 
It's the idea of a ship that has been out at sea and then the tide is moving out and the wind is moving in and they have ignored the signs until it has gotten shallow and they have felt the sand underneath the ship and they have ignored all of these warning signs until the water has moved out and now the ship is aground. That's how they have fallen. They have fallen a great way. And he says to repent, to change your mind, base your, base your life on a change of attitudes and thoughts. Change the way that you respond. It's never too late, he says. It's time now for repentance from your first love and return to your first work. Remember, it's the priority of what's important and the work is the assigned tasks. Jesus has assigned them a task. He's assigned you and I a task too. And we are to remember that first task. It's not saying yes or no, but it's keeping priority. I get asked to do a lot of things in my life and in my career. And I have to remember, what is the first thing? Maybe you remember the movie where Curly is asked about what is important in life. Not Curly from the Three Stooges, but Curly is asked a question. He says, there's only one thing. And you have to figure out what is that one thing. Maybe God's asking you to remain faithful to the one thing. You see, when we know what the one thing is, we can remain faithful to it. We can say no to the other things and say yes to the first thing. And Jesus says, I'm going to remove your lampstand if you don't repent. Many different ways to think about this. That their light would be removed. These are harsh words, they're hard words, and maybe you don't want to hear them, and maybe I don't want to hear them either. But it's the idea of Ephesus, this beautiful city that was a light to the whole province of Asia and the Roman world is now desolate, it's empty. Not only is the city gone, but the church is gone. And the only thing that's left of the church is just a few little things, a little few things that are scratched into the ground, into a stone. This one idea of a, of a fish that's engraved onto a, a stone walkway. Maybe that's all that's left. These early Christian symbols that say there was a church, there was a Christian movement here in Ephesus, but it's gone. And it's gone. Maybe it sounds like they didn't repent. Jesus gave them the word to say repent and the city is now gone. The church is gone. And all that's left is quiet and crumbling stones. I remember back when I was first faced with the claim of who Jesus was and how he wanted me and he wanted to change my life for the good. And I just responded because I thought, my life is so screwed up, I've messed it up so much, I want him. And the place that where I found Jesus or he found me was alive. I mean, the place was full every Sunday morning. They were putting folding chairs out in the lobby and down the aisles making room for people. The place was happening. Bible studies, there were church fellowships, meetings, groups, small groups. That's where I learned how to learn about the Bible. There was so much going on. The place was alive. Now I go back, I almost cry because the place is almost empty. It's but a skeleton of its former life. And I think did they receive those same words to return to their first love? And have they not listened? I'll tell you, it's a powerful reminder to me, and I hope it's a powerful reminder to you, that God says, do your best, do you put your right priorities, your first love. What is the first love of your life? I am the Lord your God, it says, and there is no other gods before me. And we are to keep that as the first priority. On a daily basis, are you seeking God's face? Am I seeking God's face? Putting time aside to learn of him, to read his word, to spend time with him, to receive input and 
than fellowship with other believers, allowing them to uh, grind on my life to learn to be more like Jesus. He wants you and me to be like that. But we can't put him second. He says, I want to be first. Let us run and repent. Turn our lives to the first love of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I thank you that you call us to repent, to turn around and that you will welcome us. Dear God, we are ashamed of how easily we are turned. We thank you that because Jesus died and rose again from the dead, we can have forgiveness. And it's a serious thing. So now we seriously turn back to you to walk with you today and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for joining us in our weekly Bible study. Have a great week, and bye-bye now.